Last month, we got a call that um, one of my dear friends and your neighbor had someone who was having some work done to his home. And all day long, they were in and out of the house. At the end of the day, uh, somehow, um, the couple were in their basement, relaxing, and they heard a noise in their home. Turns out that there was someone who had been watching, went into their homes, and when they discovered that there was someone actually there, they ran out. This morning, I got a call from the village president. He says that over in the Olympia Club, someone had done some a porch pirate. These are incidents in which, in our town, although we have the best, uh, I think we have the best town in the country, we have always had a legacy of, of um, being safe. And we want to continue to have that. So today, I want to first say hello and welcome you to the Public Safety Workshop. Now, this workshop is sort of designed to be a little different in that we want to make sure that real life situations that occur within our environs are going to be asked of our presenters. And before I do any of that, I want you to know that it is so important for me to acknowledge right now our sponsors. Our sponsors of this event is the Village of Olympia Fields, the um, Olympia Fields Park District, as well as the um, Public Safety Committee. Many of these members are here today. Um, the only other thing that I would say before I bring on uh, the next speaker is that uh, thanks to those who are not only in the audience, but those who are on the new technologies like Zoom, this is being broadcasted. And at the same time, hopefully next week, this will also be taped for those who cannot join us today uh, through uh, YouTube. These technologies, however, have a lot of challenges. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, my at this time, what I would like to do is to bring up my wife of 38 years, um, <laughs> Pam. Pam is one who has been with the news business for some, woo, we'll just say a long time. I shouldn't have said how many years we've been married, but, but we hope that this was going to be an interactive discussion about safety protocols in our town. Without further ado, please welcome Pam Oliver. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to see so many of our residents participating. I'm, I'm thrilled because information is, you can't put a price tag on it, you can't just buy it, you can't just assume you, you know because you're well informed or that you read the papers or that you watch TV. So this is really important. Thank you, gentlemen, for taking your time to do this. Um, because we have so many challenges, I just want to just give you a couple exam examples of personally how this has affected us. Um, we almost lost our life a couple of years ago, about three years ago, when uh, we had a carbon monoxide leak and we didn't know. It was about 5.30 in the morning and we heard this really strange sound. And it wasn't like your normal alarm. It was a strange alarm. And Kelvin and I looked at each other and we're like, well, what's that? That doesn't sound like it's an alarm. While we're debating about what it is, my son who was at the house said, do you all hear that? <laughs> Do you hear that? We're like, yeah. So we go and investigate. And within a minute, our phone was ringing and it was our alarm company saying 
your carbon monoxide detector is going off. And I said, we were just on our way to investigate. And they said, you need to get out of the house now. And I said, well, should I call the fire department? And they said, we've already called them. They're on their way. And the next thing we knew, no, the doorbell was on. We heard the alarm. We left the house. We had a carbon monoxide detector. And it saved our life. And so when the firemen came, Chicago Heights, um, they have their detectors out. They're trying to find it. They go down to the basement, and it gets louder and louder. The thing about it was it wasn't at peak, but it was very close to peak. What we didn't know was where the monoxide detector was placed was actually not close enough, and those levels should not have gotten that high. We didn't know that. But they said, call your alarm. Yes, it saved your life, but call your alarm company and tell them it needs to be moved. Almost died. We could have, but we were blessed because of our alarm system. We've also been victims of scams. And they appeal over the years as intelligent as we think we are and aware we, we, they've taken advantage of our emotions. So that's another place where they get you. So what we hope to do in this case is to have your questions and have these fine experts, these gentlemen who know what, because of what they've seen, how to protect us and keep us protected, keep us safe. First thing I want to do, though, before I even introduce them, um, are a couple of video clips that you will see, and you'll see some familiar faces. As the Ukrainian people fight to defend their country, Ukrainians in Chicago collect donations to send to the front lines. I know it. I know we win. We win. We survive. And after that, we become better than we are right now. Donation drives like this one on Belmont show just how many people across the Chicago area want to help the people of Ukraine. Here, they're collecting items like first aid kits, tactical gear, and meals ready to eat. We're told these supplies will be on a cargo plane headed to Ukraine tomorrow, hopefully ending up where they are needed. I don't think anybody's certain about anything in life, but all we can do is try to do what we can. We can sit around. There appears to be a growing number of ways to donate supplies and funds to Ukraine. The Better Business Bureau wants consumers to give, but give wisely. The Better Business Bureau says if you plan to send money through a charity, be sure to ask if the charity can get to the impacted area, if it is experienced in providing emergency relief, and how much it spends on charity versus administrative costs. Donating to a well-established organization and using, if at all possible, your credit card for donations because that's your safest bet against fraud. Meanwhile, these volunteers say they are doing what they can to help. It makes us focus on some of the positive versus just watching in silence uh, the genocide that is happening. Chris Coffey, NBC5 News. In Elmhurst, residents are concerned following Sunday's attempted carjacking in the 500 block of North Emroy. I've been living here for 30 years and I never heard anything like this. Police say a man shoveling snow was knocked to the ground by two men who demanded his car. He started fighting back. Um, ultimately, he noticed that one of them had what appeared to be a rifle on him. He grabbed that, was able to get it away from him. And at that time, the two offenders ended up fleeing the scene. The 60-year-old victim suffered minor injuries. Turns out police say the gun was only a replica. But security cameras captured this picture of the men who police say did it. This is a very uh, safe community. Um, the last time that we had something similar to this has been several years. In Naperville, police say two men stole a woman's Dodge Charger at gunpoint in the 400 block of East Bailey Road on Saturday. And Aurora police say two gunmen pulled a woman out of a car at a Wendy's parking lot Saturday when she was shot and seriously hurt. Police are still searching for her 2015 red Hyundai Santa Fe. It's not clear if any of the weekend incidents are connected. Police say if you're outside your car and someone strange comes up to you and demands your car, it's best to comply. Otherwise, police say if you're inside a parked car and you can do so, leave. Meanwhile, police in Olympia Field say there have been three carjackings at local gas stations in recent months. That's why we tell people when you're pumping gas, uh, lock your car doors, stay off the cell phone. 
pay attention to your surroundings so that you don't become a victim. They've made an arrest in one of the incidents so far, and police are touting the benefits of its village alert system for residents. Chris Coffey, NBC5 News. I would like uh, to introduce once again, Lieutenant Wendell Thomas, you heard my story. Um, I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the number of house fires has decreased tremendously since the 70s. And that our peak time for fires is during the winter. And carbon monoxide poisoning I cannot begin to tell you how many calls. We have scanners, and we're always getting calls. We're always hearing about in, in tips that they're taking X number of people out. But there's, it's still a problem. People are still dying, and there are still fires, and we forget, right? So tell us what we need to know. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I just want to thank you all for uh, allowing me to come out and talk with you today. Uh, there are a lot of uh, things when we look at, uh, you know, fire safety, uh, particularly fire safety in the home, in the residence, uh, whether that be in a single family home or in a multifamily uh, home, as well as uh, even nursing homes. So uh, we kind of cover those things as well. Um, I have a, a presentation here that we're going to kind of talk about a few things, uh, but to answer your uh, question specifically about uh, carbon monoxide. Um, so a lot of people don't understand exactly, you know, what carbon monoxide is. It's something that uh, we have certainly learned much more about, uh, even in my career as I've worked, uh, you know, in, in the fire service for over 27 years. Um, even now, let's say in the last 10, 15 years, uh, we know a lot more about uh, carbon monoxide than we once did. So um, we understand, you know, as they call it, the silent killers. So, for instance, in your situation, uh, you know, carbon monoxide is, is, is odorless, uh, it's tasteless. Uh, and so you don't know that it's there if you don't have a detector. Uh, typically, when you do uh, have a carbon monoxide emergency, um, it is uh, because you start to feel some symptoms. So you'll feel lightheaded, uh, some dizziness, headaches. Uh, sometimes you will have some shortness of breath, uh, things of that nature. So um, when that does happen, uh, obviously that's a point where now we've kind of gone past uh, the point where we, you know, we need to get out of the home. So. Um, in your situation, and I'll, I'll speak to that right now, um, your placement of a carbon monoxide detector is very important. So when you have a carbon monoxide detector, you don't want it, uh, and I'm assuming, was it in the basement? It was in the furnace room. Okay, so that's kind of what I figured. Now, I haven't been on the call, but I, I kind of figured that that's where it was. Uh, that is the absolute worst place that you could put a carbon monoxide detector, Okay. Um, when your furnace operates, uh, it has a very, very small amount of carbon monoxide that is emitted uh, just because of the combustion uh, that's involved in the heating process um, that where your furnace works. Um, the same thing with your stove. So if you have a gas stove, um, there's a very little small amount of carbon monoxide that uh, can be um, emitted when you're cooking. Okay. So, um, I would not put it in your furnace room, anywhere near your furnace. I would also not put it anywhere near your, uh, uh, kitchen. Okay. Uh, carbon monoxide detectors for the most part, you want to put them in similar spots. Also, we're going to talk about that as well. Um, with your smoke, uh, smoke alarms and smoke detectors, um, should be outside of bedrooms. Okay. Typically, when we have carbon monoxide emergencies, when they are, uh, you know, at life threatening uh, numbers, uh, typically that happens when someone is sleeping. OK, because, uh, you know, you go to sleep, your you know, your sense of awareness is obviously down. Um, so we always suggest 
Uh, if you can have them inside your bedroom, that's great if you have enough. And there are many different types of smoke, uh, carbon dioxide detectors and also smoke alarms. They do have some who, which are actually combination carbon monoxide and uh, smoke alarms as well. Uh, but the, the, the best ones that I've seen are ones that have a battery backup in them, which you can also uh, plug them into an electrical socket. Um, and it gives a reading as well. So when you talk about uh, smoke, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors, I always suggest to people that this is not the time to uh, try to be frugal. So, uh, you know, they're certainly uh, starting in ranges typically from $15 to $20 all the way up to $50 or $60. Um, you don't necessarily have to get the $50 or $60 uh, detector, but there are some nicer ones in the $30 to $40 range that will actually give you a digital readout. So um, carbon monoxide is measured in parts per million. OK, so uh, typically when uh, you when we're called our range where we would have you exit the home uh, would be from 10 up to 35. So anything anything over 35 parts per million, those are starting. And now you can start to see some symptoms. And that's when we want you to uh, obviously exit the home. Um, and you will you know, see some of the detectors will show. Uh, a slight reading of, let's say, four or five parts per million, maybe if you're cooking or something like that, uh, but then it will go down. Um, so, you know, you want to pay attention to that. Um, just as with smoke alarms, um, they, they do have a shelf life. So typically eight to 10 years is about the time range uh, that a detector will be uh, accurate. And the greatest thing about them, um, and because they've made so many advances, most of them will let you know when it's time to either uh, change a battery or that the detector is no, uh, no longer uh, accurate and needs to be replaced. Um, we get a lot of calls uh, for that. And uh, we always want you to call. We always want you to call. So if, if you're in doubt that, hey, you know, is my CO detector going off because there's an emergency or is it going off because we just need to replace the battery? Pick up the phone and call us. We'll come out, we'll check it out. We'll use our monitors. As you said, they use the monitors um, for, uh, for your incident. Uh, and once again, it, it's all about making sure that you all are safe. Um, we end up, uh, you know, I, I can't even tell you how many uh, alarms that we go on uh, for CO uh, throughout the, the year. And certainly uh, it's increased in the uh, winter months. Um, mo most often than not, uh, it's because of people uh, heating their homes, using their stoves, um, or, you know, alternative means of heating their homes um, where they are not using their furnace. If their furnace has not been uh, serviced, so you should have your furnace uh, service, if not every year, every other year for sure. Um, but I, I, I would suggest you have it, you know, service, especially if you have an older home and make um, Same thing with your uh, your oven, your 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 stove. If you have a gas uh, stove, make sure that that service make clean, uh, vacuum uh, the vents. Uh, all of those things can contribute, that buildup can contribute uh, sometimes to some small amounts of CO. So um, we always suggest, you know, uh, we're, we're, I think we're approaching next, uh, next week uh, is uh, daylight saving time. Uh, so we always suggest to people that at time, so twice a year, that you check your smoke detector batteries, you check your uh, carbon monoxide detectors, and do those maintenance things um, that will keep your home uh, safe as possible as you can. I have a little uh, uh, slideshow here. Just go through some real quick things. Just kind of give you all uh, information uh, about fire. Uh, also, we're talking about uh, smoke detector, smoke detectors, and also uh, uh, fire extinguishers. So. 
Fire is a chemical process that results from bringing together fuel, oxygen, and heat, thereby producing light. So uh, we kind of call that the fire triangle. Um, it's a, uh, 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 the chemical process and what we call completing it, the fire tetrahedron. So you have heat, you have fuel, and then uh, you have oxygen, and that uh, makes it uh, the chemical process, and that's what we'll go to. So this is that fire, fire uh, triangle that I was talking about. Uh, so, you know, once again, this is where any, any fire uh, that is, uh, you know, any fire, these are three things that it takes for it to burn. Uh, what we do, and it's very simple, uh, in order to put a fire out, we remove one of those elements. So how can we protect ourselves? Uh, we talked about this already, fire alarms, sprinkler systems. Do any of you all have sprinkler systems in your homes? Does anybody have any? And that's something that you're starting to see uh, in new uh, construction, uh, that people are actually putting in residential fire uh, sprinkler systems. Um, also heat detectors, smoke detectors, uh, smoke alarms. So the difference between a uh, detector and an alarm, it, you know, a detector obviously will tell you that there's smoke. It will tell you that there's heat, um, but it does not alarm. So, you know, we try to promote to people to say you, you need a smoke alarm or uh, something of that nature. <clears throat> and the other thing, too, and, and we talk about this a lot of. Uh, we, we just started recently, obviously due to COVID, we've not been out in the, uh, the schools. One of the biggest things that we do is we go and we talk um, in schools, we talk to the kids about uh, fire safety. And one of the main things that we you know, tell them is know, know how to get out. So basically having a plan um, to be able to get out of your house. As a matter of fact, we tell them no two ways out. Uh, meaning that, you know, if one way is blocked, that they have another way of getting out. So, um, you know, that's something. And, and I, you know, I really enjoy working with the kids. And uh, one of the things that I always do is I give them a homework assignment. And part of that homework assignment is to go home and to talk to their parents and talk to uh, their family members about having a plan in case there is a fire emergency in their home. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that plan, uh, you know, doesn't have to be something that, you know, is drawn out and, and posted on the refrigerator or something like that. Uh, it just has to be something that, you know, you can, you know, I always say keep try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, when 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 there's a fire emergency uh, or, or, you know, anything of that nature, uh, you know, we always say people don't call us to come over for coffee. You know, you call us because this is the worst time in your life. Your, your home is burning or, you know, someone's sick, uh, you know, what have you. And so your your sense of awareness is, is kind of dulled because you're worried about what's going on in your home. So that is not the time to have things be complicated. So we try to give you simple, easy things to do. Um, you know, like I said, we talk to our, our, our students in the schools and we talk to them about staying low. OK, because, you know, heat rises, smoke, uh, you know, at the lower levels in your home, you're going to have much less heat. Uh, typically much less smoke. So, you know, we try to teach people about those things. Uh, one of the things that we even talk about as well um, is when you go to sleep. So when you go to sleep, do you leave your doors open or do you close your bedroom door? Open? Okay. Okay. So actually you should close your bedroom door. Okay. Um, all doors are rated, they're fire rated. Uh, they will have a certain amount of protection. So in other words, if there is a fire outside of your bedroom, outside of your bedroom, having that door closed might be the simple 
uh, most effective way of keeping the fire and the smoke from getting to you. Um, we always teach if you are going to, you know, if your smoke alarm is going off and your door is closed before you open the door, feel the door. Use the back of your hand and feel the door to see if there's heat. If it's hot, we want to keep that door closed. OK, um, we will be there. We will come in. We will get you. But the whole point is that when you open that door, you introduce air and all of the uh, smoke and, and heated, superheated gases and, and possibly even fire itself into that into the bedroom. So how does fire kill? We kind of just talked about that. So it consumes oxygen, uh, it produces smoke and poisonous gases. Uh, and then one thing that a lot of people uh, don't understand is that actually smoke, the smoke and the superheated gases, um, those will, will kill you much faster than the fire itself. Uh, most people, if you hear of people who were either injured or uh, you know worse in a, in a house fire, um, it was due to smoke inhalation. So once again, that's why we always try to um, you know, get people to understand, hey, let's keep that, that door closed uh, when you're sleeping. And, I, and once again, I think we talked about some counterintuitive things. Um, that certainly is counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive to think most people like to keep their doors open, you know, air flowing, especially, you know, if it's warm, you know, we want to keep the AC going or warm circulation or it's cool, something like that. But absolutely positively keeping that door closed um, will save your life. So smoke alarms, we just talked about that. So um, on every level outside of each bedroom. So you want to have your uh, smoke detectors uh, and smoke alarms. If you have, let's say, a three bedroom home where all three bedrooms are right next to each other, you can have one detector that would be would serve for all three of those bedrooms. Uh, but if they're spread apart, you'll need to have and also on each level. So you should have a smoke detector uh, in your basement as well as near the bedrooms and not necessarily in the kitchen, but maybe outside of the kitchen uh, in a living room or a hallway, something like that. Uh, they, you know, we always talk, you know, like I said, change those batteries twice a year. So, um, you know, head next, tank, uh, check your batteries, make sure that they're good. Uh, and then the other part, too, and this is something that happens. Uh, we see a lot of people are remodeling their homes and remodeling their homes. They're painting. You paint over the uh, detector. And all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. Uh, so, you know, be aware of those things uh, when you are doing your remodeling. Also, too, one thing that we see a lot of, and this is very unfortunate, uh, when we see people who are remodeling homes, let's say you're painting or you're, you know, doing drywall. They'll take the detector down because they're doing. Then they forget to put it back up. So uh, remember that uh, we have a lot of fires in homes that are either being remodeled or homes under construction uh, because of things like that. Uh, and then, like I said, there are eight to 10 year life. Typically, uh, you know, some will last a, a little bit longer, but 10 years is about the limit. Uh, for most of them in terms of their, and, and that's why we also tell you too, to check them because sometimes they may not last that full 10 years. So what causes fire in our homes? Uh, cooking, smoking, uh, electrical, candles, and also art. And we do get some arson fires. Um, unfortunately, it's something that happens. It is not something that happens very often. Um, one of the things that we kind of talk about too is, is arson is typically pretty easy to recognize. You know, when when uh, the fire marshal does uh, an investigation, they come out pretty much every every fire that we have. So any fire involving a structure has to be investigated. Um, so we will do an investigation uh, from the fire department. Uh, step further, depending on the whether we call uh, the uh, Mavis local team or if we call out the state fire marshal to come out and investigate it. Uh, and they typically will be able to prove that it was arson, uh, 
Um, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, arsonists are not as easy to, uh, to catch. So, um, you know, that is something that, you know, we've seen a little more of over the last probably five or six years. Um, but, you know, it does happen. Uh, but the one there that, that I, I kind of I tell people all the time, and um, if you can see in that picture there, um, that's a fire that literally started uh, from cooking. Uh, things that we see a lot of uh, are as people who work, let's say, nights, uh, overnight. So they work, you know, late, late night shift and they come home and they decide that they want to cook and they, they're hungry and they fall asleep and uh, you know they wake up to you know to whatever it was they were cooking on the stove is now caught to uh the, the rest of the kitchen and, and sometimes worse so uh, you know we always say you know if you're going to cook uh make sure that you're you're awake and you're alert and you're you're able to do that i like to cook uh we cook at the firehouse all the time i cooked at the firehouse this morning but i made sure that i wasn't falling asleep while i was doing it Yes. And, you know, we 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 typically when we have fights or fires like that, um, you know, obviously it's terrible. Anyone loses their life for any reason. Uh, you know, it, it certainly is a tragedy. Um, but, you know, a lot of oftentimes those fires are preventable, um, you know, not having smoke detectors, uh, you know, not falling some of the safety uh, things that we talk about, um, you know, just in general and, and uh, you know, being careless with certain things. So, um, you know, and that's unfortunate. And most often, and I believe when you were talking about most often, those fires do happen at night uh, because you're sleeping. OK, so you're not up and about. You don't see it. You don't see the fire start. Uh, and then, you know, once you wake up, obviously it, it, it's too late. So this is just talk, we're talking about the uh, classifications of uh, fire. So class A is ordinary combustibles. <clears throat> uh, class B is liquids and gases. Class C is electrical. D is combustible metals. And then class K is commercial cooking oil fires. So um, if you, you know, let's say any local, the, at McDonald's, um, that would be what we would call a, a, cl a class K fire. And, and what it basically means is because of the that cooking oil, it burns so much hotter than so the oil that you would have in your home uh, would burn at a much lower temperature. Whereas if you have, let's say, a deep fryer, something like that um, at, a, at a restaurant, um, that's going to burn much higher. So have a little different classification of uh, uh, fire extinguishers. So these are residential fire extinguishers. So what you would probably have in your home. Uh, by the way, who has fire extinguishers in their home? Oh, wow. Very good. Very good. Very good. Yes. Yeah, so this is what you would have in your home. Uh, they, they're called uh, multi-purpose dry chemical extinguishers. Um, uh, typically uh, have about a 5 to 20 foot maximum effective range. Um, so what that means basically is uh, it is literally just to put a fire out in your kitchen. Okay. A small fire maybe uh, somewhere. And, and what we kind of say is if you didn't see the fire start, more than likely you will not be able to put it out. Okay. So um, as, as we like to say, when in doubt, just get out. <clears throat> so making the right decision so only stay and fight the fire if you know what is burning so you know what what it is that's actually burning so we know that that abc as i talked about that abc extinguisher that it will actually extinguish that type of fire okay um, that you have the right extinguisher and know how to use it and then fi the fire is not spreading uh, rapidly. So fire ex spreads exponentially over time. So uh, a small fire can be much, much larger in a short amount of time. So, uh, you know, you have to kind of make that decision yourself. Uh, also, if smoke has not filled the area. And then this is something that's very important. Uh, and that is that 
the extinguisher, you are between the fire and a door, right? So if, if the fire is out there and I'm standing here, I know I can get out that door. But if it's the other way around where I'm at a wall and I have no way to get out, that's not the time to stay. OK, so um, understand that we're talking about very small fires here that have just started. Uh, you know, if you're cooking something on the stove and it just, you know, lights up, or whatever, something like that, and you can grab the extinguisher real quick because you saw it actually happen. Those are the types that you can use that extinguisher. Uh, if you come in and you discover something on fire, that's probably the point where, no, we need to get out. And then the last but definitely not least, someone has called 911. Uh, pick up the phone and call us. We want to be coming right away. We don't want you. I can't tell you how many times we've responded to calls where someone tried to mitigate the emergency on their own and it ended up getting worse and then we were uh then we were called had we been called early on in the uh in the situation you know we might have been able to intervene much better <clears throat> so this is just a little thing we, we have an acronym when we talk about how to uh uh use an extinguisher so you can go ahead and it's called pass so pull the pin aim at the base Squeeze the handle and sweep side to side. So uh, it, fire extinguishers have a little pin. When you, when you get them out of the box, you pull the pin. Sometimes they will have a, uh, uh, a little switch where you can pull, pull that pin, or sometimes it'll be a little plastic uh, piece, and you can uh, pull that out of there in order to be able to uh, operate the handle. And then once you do, you aim it at the base of the fire, and then sweep back and forth until the fire goes out. Yes. We want questions, please. Any question, any question whatsoever. But I heard that, that you could take your, um, and this is a few years ago, your your extinguisher and take it to the fire department and they can refill it. Is that a real, is that a wise thing? Is that a mental that, that may have been the case at some point. Uh, what I will tell you is the extinguishers that you buy uh, for the most part now, so uh, at Walmart, at Menards, at Home Depot, um, those extinguishers are not refillable. Um, we, the extinguishers, yeah, the extinguishers that we carry, uh, those are refillable, but we have to send them out. Uh, they have to be certified. Uh, so, you know, the extinguishers that we carry are much larger. And, uh, you know, they can actually be refilled. But the ones that you buy at, uh, you know, your, your local uh, home improvement store, those cannot be refilled. Uh, we just buy a couple of them, and they were on sale, too, at one of the big stores. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, not, they're not expensive. And I believe you should have as many as you can, yes. really, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So this is just kind of showing here uh, where extinguishers might be placed. So, um, you know, this is a commercial uh, uh, building and where they're placed by doors. Um, you know, in your home, uh, I would still like to see you have it visible so, uh, so that you can grab it quickly uh, in case you need to, uh, you know, react in an emergency. So. Uh, the biggest thing is that we want to have it, and once again, near a door so that if you need to get out, you can. Uh, your, your living area. So the areas where you are around the most, right? So where we do a lot of, lot of entertainment in the, in the kitchen. So you want to have one there, uh, in your living room, maybe in your, uh, family room, uh, you know, and maybe even if you have a basement somewhere in the basement as well. So have one on each level, uh, and then also, uh, you know, near your kitchen, uh, because obviously that typically will be the most uh, time where you'll actually see some sort of fire. <clears throat> Many of us, who 
-hmm. Yes. Yes. And, and probably the most important thing there, too, is if you have uh, a... The, uh, the question was, uh, if you have a fireplace um, and, you know, making sure that the flue is open. Um, also, something that's important there, too, is making sure that your fireplace and your chimney gets cleaned, okay? Um, you know, some of those maintenance things that we talked about, uh, typically in the fall, you know, we start to use the fireplace more. So make sure that it's clean and that your chimney is clean. We get a lot of chimney fires as well. Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we. Um, I, I, I'll tell a quick, quick story. Uh, we actually had uh, last year in Chicago Heights. Uh, we had a fire that was literally started because a candle was in. Um, it was a nice day. Candle was burning, and it was in a in a decent location. Unfortunately, they had the windows open, and it was windy that day. And the wind blew the curtains into the candle and started the fire. And it, and unfortunately, um, you know, started the whole house. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the, the house was uh, not stable. So, uh, yes, candles, be very careful. I always say uh, if you're going to gonna light a candle, uh, stay in the room that you're lighting the candle. Uh, because if you leave that room... We, we all have done it. You leave the room and you forget that the candle is burning. All right. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Hey, don't forget, we have, we have giveaways and raffles, right? Yes, so yes. Don't go anywhere. Yes, right. yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry. For event listing, Father. Yes. Do you still have to have the chimney clean because the chute really does not open? So the question was, uh, for a ventless fireplace, do you still have to have the chimney clean? Um, I would still say if it's admitting uh, any kind of fumes or gases that you still want to have it clean, um, it, it doesn't hurt it to do that. Uh, you know, things are not meant to, uh, you know, operate uh, as efficiently. Uh, it won't operate as efficiently when it's not clean. So. Um, there is a different process for cleaning those, um, but I would still contact, uh, you know, your local, um, you know, uh, HVAC people just to make sure that, you know, there's nothing that you need to do specifically uh, for that type of fireplace. Before you, leave, before you leave us, can you just give us a few tips on health emergencies? Because we call you for health as well as fire. So uh, the question was some tips on, on health emergencies. So, uh, you know, we, we, we try to our best to uh, promote uh, healthy situation, healthy living situations for people. So um, one of the uh, things in terms of emergencies, uh, and, and I'm not going to get into specific, uh, you know, uh, health related issues. But what I will say to you is if you have any sort of, uh, you know, cardiac issues, um, you know, if you have a pacemaker or a defibrillator, if you are diabetic, uh, if you, you know, have had any other, uh, you know, breathing problems, uh, if you have oxygen in your home, um, these are all things that, um, we need to know. So uh, if, in fact, you do call 911 uh, for any sort of emergency, that's the information that you want to give to the dispatcher. Um, whatever the, the situation is, so um, we our, our dispatch goes through Orland Fire Department, um, Orland Fire Central Dispatch. Uh, so when you pick up 911, it goes to the county and then the county sends it to them. Um, they are our uh, individual dispatch center. 
Um, one of the great things that we have with them is we actually have a mobile data terminal system. So um, any information that you give them, they're typing that information in and we have that information on the mobile data terminal. So um, if you have any kind of health issues whatsoever, um, you know, the more information that you can give, uh, the better that it's going to be uh, for us when we respond, especially, uh, you know, in, a, in an emergency situation where, uh, you know, you may not necessarily be alert or oriented or even conscious for that matter. Um, we also to recommend um, if you have uh, uh, alarm systems in your home that you also connect it um, with uh, medical systems too. So I see a lot of people that have uh, medical alarm systems in their home if they have an emergency, just like you would for a fire emergency, you can press a button that uh, sends it to an EMS emergency as well. Um, so, you know, we always tell people to give us the most information that you can uh, because that typically is going to make the difference as to when we get there, having that information beforehand so that we can respond accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.